We're very lucky today because um, uh, Bruce and David have agreed to talk to us about the origin of life and what more appropriate place to do it. Here um, on the Shaw River, next to the outcrop of the Strelly Pool Church, the Stromatolite Discovery outcrop. So when Dave and I got together and we were looking at this system, uh, what I thought was, well, sort of do a thought experiment around the whole system. What happens when the hydrothermal field of the pool comes up again and it peels off a, a large number, trillions of these vesicles, each with random polymers. Now that that you can sort of see, we can, we've stained the acridine orange, we've seen DNA contained within these. So this, this happens. But where we get into the jump off point is well, what happens where when the pool cycles down? And it turns out when the pool cycles down through uh, some uh, basically le water leaving or dehydration especially, uh, the vesicles that contain those functional polymers that are still around will potentially dump their cargoes back into the lamellae. So that's the whole, we think of that as the whole cycle. So the, the, the layers have formed, the synthesis of these polymers has occurred. They have delivered some of the polymers into these bubbles, if you will, soap bubbles. The soap bubbles, which are stable enough, long enough, return back and their, their contained polymer systems are still there when the drying down occurs and these vesicles flatten out and their uh, lipid walls fuse back with the, uh, the anhydrous or dry phase. That's why it's coupled phases. The phases are coupled. So think of it like these molecules are in glassware all the time. They're isolated from the environment, but through two different sort of life cycles. One life cycle is where they're being synthesized in the anhydrous phase. The second part of the life cycle is they're being selected for. They're being tested. Tested for what? their ability to stabilize their host vesicle. Now what does that mean? Well in the beginning, what happens to bubbles, soap bubbles? They eventually grow and grow and pop. They can actually elongate. These vesicles can elongate in water as they add lipid in a physical process and they can pull themselves apart. Now Jack Shostak's lab has shown that. So what do you want to do to have a vesicle that's longer lived? You want to stabilize it. Maybe with a polymer that's like a cytoskeletal component that layers the inside of the vesicle that actually is structurally connected to one side and the other. So cytal, we call this the S polymer for stability. Now when the S polymer is there, that means that every other polymer, every other cargo that's contained within the, the bubble is going to make the full cycle, potentially. And you're actually going to see amplification of systems in that early stage. But this is just a soap bubble that is just persistent. You know, we are actually sort of, we are all soap bubbles, except we don't dissolve when we take a shower, you know. <laughs> because why? Because all of our reactions are, they're going away from equilibrium. We're constantly overcoming the effects of hydrolysis, constantly. This is still happening in your bodies today. So what would the, the sequence of polymers emer uh, emerge, what sequence of polymers and functions would emerge? This is a model for the simultaneous lifting of all the functions of life. Think of like it booting an operating system, your, your iOS on your phone. When you boot an entire operating system up, you have to start a lot of processes, many of which are invisible. They're feedback controls, they're services, etc. You don't see that. So complex systems lift themselves into being through complex processes. It's not simple, it's not linear. So it's not in a sense RNA world where you get an informational polymer and then a, a metabolic world where metabolism occurs and then a, 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 a world of compartmentalization as some, some research as schools of thought have suggested. I believe it's an operating system booting up in the, in the Archean at some point. So the operating system might consist of, well, you've got to stabilize your vesicle. If you don't have vesicle stability, you lose all the information and all the complexity you've built up. So what might be the second class of polymer? It's what we call the P-polymer, or pore-forming polymer. Because if you can't get things in and out of your bubble, you can't do any other processes. So a P-polymer might uh, just form a really simple pore, and there's some models with our colleagues at NASA Ames of, of super simple early pores that are plausible. The, the, think of it as a, a soap bubble with a hole in it. Weird concept. 
but you have to have it because then right on the back of that with a concentrated solution with your, your pores, you could have metabolism emerge. M polymers, for example, metabolic processes, doing other jobs ultimately that have to s provide more stability to, to, the, to the bubble. And then beyond that, the emergence of templates that can be used to catalyze and make copies of molecules and make a supply of copies of molecules in a cycle. So you can make more of one thing under control. And we call those the, the, the CRR polymers. And then uh, feedback. If you're making copies of things in large numbers based on nutrients coming in through your pore, those reactions can run out of control. You get too much of something, you can burst your vesicles. So those things are selected out by the emergence of feedback polymers that, that control these subtle processes, F polymers. So you've got, this whole system coming to existence, why? Because it has a scaffolding it can rely on, which is this bathtub ring of dried films or semi-dried films around your, your pool. That's a scaffolding that allows you to do synthesis of whole systems of polymers without having to divide a cell in the process. If you have to divide a protocell, that's a very high risk operation, which will you know, think of yourself if you took a took a knife and cut yourself toe to, you know, top to bottom, that's a really high risk operation. You just don't do that. So that in a sense, that division of protocell is the highest risk uh, chasm to cross in molecular evolution. That's which life is bumps up against doing that. And for that, we came up with this just general notional concept of a D polymer, a polymer that both creates a, a stochastic, perhaps only a probabilistic copying of all the molecular tool sets and the of the poly functional polymers within within a protocell in solution, creates that copy, those two copies, pushes them to either end of the protocell, and then has a function time just right to cause that division. And you now can divide in solution. You, you can make polymers in solution, manage the process, manage your membrane, and manage the replication of that whole process in solution. You don't need the anhydrous phase. And what happens when that occurs is something, it's a whole new physics opens up into the system because now that you can do this trick without waiting down for the periodicity of the dry down cycle, you can do this at will. Maybe some of the divisions will fail. It will probably be high failure in, in these early life uh, cell divisions. But what you do is you buy time because now a cell doesn't wait for drying down cycle. It has time that it didn't have before. It's persistence. And with time, it has distribution. So it, if, it's, if it's washed out of the little cleft, out of the little pool, and it's washed down through the hydrothermal field, it can find itself in another, another small pool with concentrated nutrients, with so plenty of supplies to form a new colony in, a, in effect. Now being on this trip, sort of winding the clock forward, going from Shark Bay all the way through the stratomatolite formations, especially seeing those desert uh, those desert microbial mats, it suddenly occurred to, to us that, well, wait a minute, you have, if you, if you posit that life began on land and that you're also posing that therefore life can distribute itself through the hydrothermal field and establish new colonies, there's other distribution methods such as wind. So because you can dry down so there, there are two ways of gaining persistence in the system. One is that you can divide the protocell so you can have persistence, but that's only in the presence of being able to do metabolism. When you dry down, these same protocells could dry down against their, their mats, their emerging almost polymeric mats, dry down, and because life came from a ability to deal with dehydration, because dehydration was the initial energy for it, life can effectively go into dormant phase easily because it comes from that process. That's sort of the beginnings of like the spores and seeds metaphor. So if you have a dried film that has some protocells in it, it is like the beginning of a microbial mat. It could be potentially lifted by wind. It could potentially float, you know, in a spring system and distribute widely. So because it can stay, uh, stay viable, because it can survive with dehydration. 
So then what you would you might look at is say, how does life get distributed globally and effectively to the seashores? Well, what, what you guys did in a brilliant way is walk us back through that path, i.e., say for instance, wind comes up and pulls some of that film out of your initial biogenesis pool, ends up in a smaller pool that's still fed with pretty good nutrients. That's a tougher environment, that's selection pressures. But if that life can manage to adapt to that slightly different pool environment, it's lifted again or flows, however it does, and it goes into more of a desert pool that has high saline uh, content, a little higher saline, and it starts to adjust to the saline environment. Then it starts to adjust to even being on the surface, just being occasional rainfall and dew, because it can go through dehydration and stay viable. And then ultimately, uh, through you know weathering, through just processes, it can end up in a in a saline estuary, maybe a lightly saline estuary at the seashore, and it can work its way up. And those 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 films or those mats, if they were sort of proto mats, they're already really they're fully intact communities that are moved on the move. They reach that estuary and they can survive in in you know more fresh parts of the estuary, and then they gradually develop the ability to form your stromatolites and, and more sophisticated mats. So for me, it's a it's a beautiful opening, uh, a complete understanding, being in the field to say. We not only might have a viable model for life's origin from simple solutes to cell division, but seeing all this, a model for its distribution and evolution up the scale, very simply, very linear. You know, you're talking mats, you're talking individuals, but where there are mats and communities, you know, power and community, but, but an evolutionary path to get to stromatolites at the seashore and to get to those structures just straight off of a land environment and getting to the marine environment and then going from there. So I, th you know, I think we could write a really good paper or, or a big monograph with a lot of diagrams and whatnot, a, a kind of making a case for this, not only origin, but distribution and evolutionary paths for life after origin.